Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 21st of May, 2021. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So the biggest piece of news over the last 24 hours was this report that came out, uh, or I guess this news article that came out that said the US Federal Reserve plans to publish a paper on a potential issuance of a CBDC or a central bank digital currency. This is very bullish, I think. I don't think CBDCs in general are anything like super interesting. I think that they're, you know, classic kind of legacy kind of, I guess, like tech here um, that institutions are trying to kind of create on board. But the reason why I think this is exciting and why I think this is really bullish is because of a tweet that I put out that may have confused some people here where I said, CBDCs uh, legitimize crypto and we won. And by we won, I mean crypto won. Now, some people would have dis <clears throat> disagreed with this saying, you know, like Dan here, that CBDCs and crypto are completely different things. And I don't think that's the case. I think that to the general public, uh, crypto and digital currencies and CBDCs and all this sort of stuff, it all means the same thing to them, right? It essentially means digital, digitally native money, right? Because money in a bank account, people don't really uh, associate that or, or kind of like think of that as like purely digital money, right? They think of that as like an IOU for the cash that they have in a bank account somewhere in some vault, right? Even though you might not, you might not even have access to most of the cash or ever like basically withdraw, you know, you know, your savings from a cash account or whatever like that. Um, you still think of it as like physical, right? Because you grew up with it and it's just, you know, what's ingrained into your head. Whereas with crypto, with truly digital native kind of things, you don't think of the physical aspect of it. Like when I think of ETH, I don't think of a physical kind of coin or physical aspect. You know, I know that a lot of the Bitcoin articles, they might use a physical coin to represent Bitcoin. But no one ever really thinks of it like that. It is truly digitally native. So what a CBDC is, it's a digitally native, uh, you know, central bank currency, essentially. That's the whole goal of it at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, it's not going to be decentralized, right? It's going to be completely regulated and controlled and like really locked down. But the point is, is that by governments, nation states, institutions all kind of embracing crypto in their own way, like, you know, governments embracing it with CBDCs, institutions embracing it by buying some on their balance sheet, uh, some legacy, legacy kind of companies integrating, you know, crypto and all that sort of stuff. Just by, uh, I guess, like integrating with it and working with it, it legitimizes it and basically sends a signal to the entire world that this stuff is here to stay. They're not going to ban it, right? They're going to regulate it, of course, and they're going to regulate like the fiat on ramps, which they've already done, right? I mean, there was a report that came out yesterday that said, uh, exchanges are now going to have to report any time a user does like a transaction or ten thousand dollars or whatever. I actually thought that was already the case, to be honest. Like, I think that anytime I do anything on a centralized exchange, it is just completely monitored and recorded, and it's just all those records are there for any government that wants to access them. Like, I I don't have any notion of financial privacy on those things. And even within Ethereum, if you're not using a privacy protocol, you know your address is exposed to the world. You shouldn't have any uh, kind of like allusions to privacy or, or anything like that. So from that point of view, I was just like, well, and I think to myself, I'm like governments and nation states and whatever, they don't regulate something that they're going to ban. Like you can think about smoking, for example, uh, smoking in particularly in Australia, what, what the government did to curb people from, from, from smoking cigarettes is that they just increased the taxes on them. They didn't ban it because they knew if they banned it, it would just become a black market. So instead of banning it, they just regulated it. So by the government not banning it and by, by kind of like embracing crypto, they're basically saying, they're saying two things. They're saying, well, we can't ban it, first of all, because it is impossible to ban it. It'd be like trying to ban the internet or trying to ban like peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks in general, like file sharing and things like that. So I think that, you know, they they they, they probably understand that, that part of it. And secondly, they also kind of, I guess, you know, at least not the whole government, but like some parts of the government see the value in it. That's why they're commissioning papers to, on CBDC. That's why they're looking into all this crypto stuff. That's why they haven't strangled it completely yet. And they also realize that the economic benefits that these kind of things can can bring to their own country and to the world are immense and shouldn't be strangled. It's the same thing that happened with the internet, right? 
I think the internet is like a, a perfect a perfect kind of like a predecessor and, and and precursor to crypto that allows all these kind of people to, to see what happened with the internet and be like, okay, well, we don't want to make the same mistakes we did with the internet where we kind of thought it was a joke, or kind of thought it wouldn't get very big because a lot of companies and institutions did that and they were left behind and, and they lost out and they got disrupted by all these startups. So I think these days people look at disruption and, and, and things like that and the kind of um and, and new technologies and they go, okay, well, we need to get ahead of that. That's why you see a lot of this private blockchain stuff spinning up like and all these sort of stuff like that's that's all noise right in the long term private blockchains aren't going to win everyone's just going to be on this public shared kind of infrastructure but this is exactly how the internet evolved too um, but I think at, at this point, it's like every company has, a, every big company has like an R&D division. And anytime there's some some kind of new technology that comes out that's relevant, uh, they, they kind of do commissioned research papers on it. They do MVPs. They, uh, they do, you know, proof of concepts and things like that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as they do that and as time goes on, we get to the point of like, okay, well, that was a waste of time or that didn't work. Let's focus on the things that do work. But as an industry as a whole, I don't see governments banning crypto, uh, you know, even even stricter governments or like governments that are, are viewed as like, um, I guess, like uh, like China, as someone who's basically said, well, we're going to ban crypto. And they've said that or ban Bitcoin. They've said that like 30 times probably at this point. And every single time it has just been someone somewhere saying it or it's been fake news or whatever. They're not going to ban crypto. Like even the, the most heavy handed, uh, I guess, like um, nation states or even like literal kind of like di dictatorships like North Korea they're not going to ban it. I mean, like North Korea is maybe a bit of an extreme example here. And I don't, I'm not, I don't know the geopolitics around this, but in general, like by banning something and by, by, by denying your citizens uh, access to it, you're essentially hamstringing your own economy, especially if it's something that's going to be huge. And, you know, I know countries like China basically created their own internet, right? They can still talk to the public internet, but they have their own versions of different, um, uh, different apps and stuff. Like they have their own Facebook and, and kind of like Twitter and, and, and and all that sort of stuff and Google and things like that. That that's fine. And maybe they have their own blockchain. I don't know. There was I remember back in 2017 people were speculating that Neo was going to be the Ethereum of China and there were some other ones out there and I, I don't know if that's going to be the case, right? I don't know if if the if um the Chinese government who have actually been doing a lot of um experimentation with CBDCs, I don't know if they're just going to fork Ethereum and create their own EVM chain, right? For example, who knows what they're going to do there. But I think the underlying theme and the and the 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 kind of like summary here of everything that's happening is essentially that outright banning it is not a path that most countries are going to take. Like I can guarantee, like there might be like maybe a handful, like five or less countries that actually ban this stuff. And and when you look at like I guess like countries in general, you have to look at the ones that are like third world countries or war torn or developed, you know, where they kind of are and, and who has access to them. Like a dictatorship like North Korea, you know, their citizens aren't going to have the same access to, you know, even the internet as we do, no, nowhere near the same um, and, 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 and things like that. So I think when you just take a holistic approach, the world is complex. Many nation states make it up. There's game theory that plays out everywhere. And I think the game theory of crypto at the end of the day is you don't ban it. You either embrace it or you heavily regulate it. Um, and, and, you know, every government nation state is going to have a different approach to this sort of stuff. But anyway, I think, you know, the genie, the rabbit, whatever is out of the hat, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, this isn't going away. I think governments know that. And I think that the more proactive and democratic ones aren't going to ban this. They're just going to either embrace it. It's going to take them a while. Like governments move slow, right? Um, and even if they regulate it, that's still going to take a while. I saw that, that, that rule about that over $10,000 rule wouldn't even go into effect until like 2023, if it went into effect at all. And it's like, okay, well, that's like two years away, right? That's an eternity in crypto. Like think about where crypto was two years ago. It was, uh, it was uh, what, May 2019, right? Like very, very different. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, and I'd love to know how they handle DeFi in that case as well. But yeah, so that's, I guess, my like overall thesis as to why I think something like a CBDC just legitimizes crypto as a whole and is really bullish for crypto overall. It's not something that interests me. Like I'm interested in open public blockchains like Ethereum, obviously interested in assets like ETH that are fully decentralized. Um, but I think in general, like these nation states and governments can issue these things. They can basically have a fully digitally native thing that exists within the crypto umbrella. And that's just going to legitimize the whole sector for a lot of people. So yeah, but I'll leave it at that for now. Lots more to get through in today's episode. Another, I guess like another government related thing here is that a, a member of parliament, Tom 
Oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna fail pronouncing his surname, so I'm not even gonna try it. I'm just gonna call him Tom. <laughs> uh, he he mentioned the flippening in Parliament in the in the UK Parliament here. What? <laughs> What? Like, literally, he said um, something about, like, uh, ETH flipping Bitcoin, and I was just like, no. And then this video has has the clip of him doing that, uh, and this was posted from his own Twitter account, so definitely go go watch this. It'll be linked in the YouTube description. But when he said that, I was like, this is crazy. And then I saw um, other people saying that in later in his speech, he spoke about how he listens to Bankless as well, uh, which I thought was hilarious. It's like, wow, that's awesome. Like, we have these members of parliament... In, you know, in the U in the UK, that are listening to to Bankless and getting kind of like, as I like to call it, ETH pilled, right, and DeFi pilled, and all that sort of stuff, and even saying things like that, the flipping is going to happen. That's just crazy to me. So I think, in general, like, I mean, this is just what I was saying before about how governments, you know, obviously they're made up of 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 a lot of different people, but like when you have members of parliament like saying stuff like this, it lends a lot of legitimacy to it. People get excited because they're like, wow, our leaders, you know, are actually saying things that that are that are true, right? They're actually embracing this technology and it just adds so much legitimacy to everything. So yeah, I thought this was really cool. I highly recommend going and watching this little clip here. It's only 51 seconds of uh, of, of Tom saying it. Um, I, I was just taken aback by it because I didn't think we would get here this fast. Like the flipping is like such a crypto meme, right? It is... It is such a crypto meme that I think most people don't even know about it, even in crypto. Like, I think it's a, it's something that is, is spoken about when ETH is gaining on the ratio, right, against Bitcoin. But, you know, it's spoken about in different contexts too. Like, Bitcoiners will say it and joke about it and, and, and you know, say it's never going to happen. And, like, this is just, um, it, it, you know, ETH heads being ETH heads. And, you know, Ethereans will celebrate and be like, yes, this has always been the case and, and things like that. But to hear someone kind of, I guess, like outside of our little bubbles uh, say this on parliament floor in the UK, like this isn't a small parliament either. This is the UK, right? It's a very large Western democracy um, is is really, uh, really, really exciting, I think. And, and kind of like just, I think, speaks to what I was saying before about how governments are going to embrace crypto in many different ways. Different uh, members of parliament will have, obviously, and members of, of Congress, wherever, whatever country it is, are going to have different opinions on things. But I think that the main, main themes that they're all going to embrace it one way or another. So we finally got some news from Optimism here. And why am I not following Etherscan? That's weird. I thought I was. Anyway, uh, so Optimism announced that they are collaborating with Etherscan. There is now a Etherscan that tracks Optimism's layer two. Now, obviously, there's not a lot going on there right now because Optimism is only synthetics right now. But this is what I was talking about the other day about how... I can't remember which refill it was on. Maybe it was a while ago. But I was talking about how... Optimism had to delay their launch because they weren't ready with things like this. This is the critical infrastructure that needs to be in place before you can launch something like a layer two or a side chain, right? And, and even Polygon, for example, uh, I, they've been teasing that they have an Etherscan implementation coming, but they've only got a very simple block explorer right now, which is which is you know way behind what Etherscan gives you in terms of features. So I think Etherscan is building itself a little bit of a moat here of being a, a, a basically a um a really great uh, a block explorer uh, for different kind of layer twos and different chains, what speed side chains or whatever like that. Because everyone's used to it, right? Everyone's used to Etherscan. Everyone knows how to navigate it. So just cloning it and, and tracking different networks is really easy to do. Um, but the reason why I think this is so exciting is one, I mean, we finally get an update from Optimism, but two, as I said, this is one of the fundamental building blocks before these layer twos can start taking off. I think we're going to see Uniswap on Layer 2 very soon. And someone posted a, a, a screenshot in the Daily Gray Discord today uh, from the Optimism Discord. Basically, uh, one of the team members, I think, of Optimism was teasing that Uniswap is going live very, very soon. And I think that just falls right in line with them releasing this block explorer here. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Uniswap live within the next two weeks. It could even happen any day now. It could happen next week. I would say within the next two weeks, we would see Uniswap live on, on Optimism's layer two here, which is super exciting as well. I've, I've spoken about in the past how I think that Uniswap at layer two just changes the game in general because Uniswap is such a, uh, a well-known product. It is the most used app on Ethereum by far. And it is also an app that pretty much like everyone uses, right? Everyone trades tokens. Everyone, uh, you know, I mean, that's like, the main use case of, of a lot of Ethereum right now is like token trading and things like that. So, and obviously that takes up a lot of gas on the network. I think 35% between Uni V2 and V3. So yeah, super exciting. Can't wait to see how this shakes out. Uh, I think this is really, really cool. And it seems like 
They do have, I guess, latest transactions going on here. Uh, but their L1 batches seems to be lagged here. But I think maybe that's just because they... they that, That's just how frequently they do it. Or maybe they just haven't done it. Because, uh, you know, even though it's on main, it's still a very closed off thing. Only Synthetics is live for now uh, and things like that. But still, very, very cool. And this is probably going to be... Uh, Block Explorer to watch for an alpha leak on which uh, projects are going to be uh, are launching and they just haven't spoken about launching on Optimism yet, haven't announced it yet. But anyway, uh, this is really cool to see. Uh, I'm I'm really happy we got news out of Optimism because I was like, you know, they've been so quiet for so long. I love this team, but like, come on, give us something, throw us a bone. And they did. And as I said, if you sit in their Discord channel, you're going to get free alpha out of there as well. So yeah, really cool to see this from Optimism. So speaking of block explorers, uh, Tim Baiko tweeted out today that Baikul, Baikal, Baikul, I don't know how to pronounce this, uh, Block Explorer now shows full 1559 transaction data, which is really, really cool. So I don't know what Baikul is. I'm assuming it's some sort of Ethereum testnet that they spun up for 1559. I somehow missed this. Um, but anyway, what this uh, uh, what this kind of like screenshot is showing is the full 1559 transaction data as it will look like once it's live on the Ethereum mainnet. So obviously, you have a bit of difference here. You still have your uh, gas limit. You still have, uh, you know, your gas used by the uh, transaction and GUI and all that. But now you have uh, the max priority fee per, per gas, which is the kind of like ma max way you will pay for the transaction or what you're willing to go up to. Um, and then max fee per gas as well, uh, which is basically, you know, times uh, multiplying those two together here. Um, so, uh, and block info is also available. So as uh, Tim says here, this block, uh, which he links to here, burnt 63,000 uh, uh, 63, gas times seven, which is 441,000 way, which is which works out to, I think, oh man, I'm not going to do the head math correctly here. But yeah, there, there was some ETH burned here. But that's another, you know, metric that block explorers are going to be tracking now, right? Is how much ETH was burned in, in each transaction, which is going to be so cool for screenshots. Imagine like all those big kind of like fee transactions that we've seen in the past and then just seeing the amount of ETH that gets burned on, on a lot of them, which I thought was was really, really cool. But uh, yeah, um, it's funny, like Peter from Geth is saying, um, we, we, you murdered that field. Can we just call it max tip in, in gas? Uh, and obviously, like as Tim says here, UIs are going to be improved over time and things like that, uh, def depending on the wallet and depending on the block explorer as well. But still cool to see this. I mean, 1559 is, is hopefully less than two months away now. I know everyone goes on about July 14th being the, the date it's going live. I do want to just caution again that that's a target date. Anything can happen. Any, you know, they're there's a possibility that it could be delayed for whatever reason. You know, I don't think so. I think everything is is, is is in place right now. I think the only thing that could delay us is maybe the ecosystem projects and the infrastructure not being ready to support 1559. But, you know, they've still got plenty of time to integrate. So we'll see how that goes there. So ZK Sync today detailed their three-factor approach to security in ZK Sync 2.0. And this is the strategy that they're using to keep funds safe. So they have a few different things that they're doing here. So essentially what they're doing is they're setting up security by isolation and redundancy. So what this means is that uh, ZK Sync 2.0 relies on multiple independent mechanisms to guarantee security. Um, you know, in addition to their z zero knowledge proofs here, uh, they have all of their transactions being verified uh, naively by ZK Sync validators before being included in a block. Uh, they have trust minimized upgradability. So they'll be able to upgrade the contracts, of course, but uh, they they want to do that in a very trust minimized way. And they also have uh, the ZK Sync Security Count Council, which is a collection of 15 respected members of the Ethereum community that will have uh, power to uh, basically shorten the notice period. So the, the, the time lock that they have here, which is a four week time lock. Uh, but like this Security Council can shorten that, you know, in cases like some critical bug or security issue or something like that. This is really cool that that uh, ZK Sync is kind of detailing their security architecture here. I think this is very important uh, because obviously we want to get the scalability and decentralization at layer two, but we also want to make sure it's secure. We want to make sure that you know the rug j can't just be pulled from from under us, right? And things like that. And as you can see here, a lot of uh, names you all be familiar with, people that are that are joining on. Uh, that you know, the Ave Core teams joining Itamar from from Argent here. Uh, I'm not going to read them all out, but you can see here Michael from Curve and Stephen Stephen from Gnosis and and a few others down here as well. So yeah, really cool to see this from zk Singh. I'm glad that they're taking security very seriously here. I think all the layer two teams. Teams are that's why they've taken so long to launch is because uh, they want to make sure everything's secure and that user funds are safe so really really cool to see this from zk sync 
So Yearn Finance announced one of their biggest product releases uh, yesterday, I think, which is the Synthetics SNX Staking Vault. So essentially what this allows you to do is stake your SNX in a Yearn Vault and it will automatically manage the entire process for you. Now, obviously SNX staking has been very popular in the past for a lot of people, but the main concerns were around gas fees, which layer two, of course, um, alleviates, but still there are some problems around um, kind of like uh, gas fees on layer one. And debt management, of course, as well. Uh, so what, is, what this vault will essentially do is that it'll claim uh, your SNX rewards for you weekly. So you don't have to do them manually yourself. And you don't have to pay the gas fees because all the claims are done in batches. Or done in a batch, sorry. Um, and then with uh, with your SUSD that you borrow, it'll be automatically deposited into Yearn's SUSD vault to earn yield here, which is really, really cool. So, uh, I mean, this is awesome. Yearn is like by far the leader in yield aggregation here and just like creating these vaults that make everyone's life easier, not just from an automation standpoint, but also from a, um, you know, gas fee saving standpoint and just like quality of life overall kind of standpoint for people here. So really positive to see this. And if you're an SNX staker and you just want to put it on autopilot, then I highly suggest checking out this product. So Robert Miller from uh, Flashbots here tweeted out a, a, a metric uh, I guess like a chart that shows daily minor profit in ETH from MEV. Now it reached an all-time high. Uh, I think yesterday or the twenty on the twentieth of, of May here. Obviously because of the uh, volatility within the markets, and you can see here that uh, miners are essentially sorry, not miners, but like MEV extractors in general. Um, uh, uh, oh wait, no, no miners. Sorry, sorry. I was I was I was thinking of something else there. The the the, the basically the minor profit uh, from from Flashbots is up at over fourteen hundred ETH here, and you can see the growth over April and May has just been you know quite explosive as opposed to, to earlier in the year, and that's because Flashbots allows miners to take advantage of MEV now instead of uh, just leaving it up to people to to basically do it and bypass miners or whatever and just go through the public mempool. I won't talk too much about Flashbots because I've I've gone over that plenty of times in the past, uh, so I won't kind of go into detail here, but essentially this just means that miners are making even more money. So, you know, you remember how they were all complaining about 1559 and things like that? Well, you know, the MEV that they're extracting here is more than enough to make up for the revenue loss that they're going to suffer with 1559 at the end of the day. And I think this is a really great way to address that. So obviously they've been fast on the uptake here. I think over 60% of hash rate now uses flash bots. So I think that's just going to continue to grow as well. So some really cool news out of the index co-op here. The DeFi Pulse Index is now listed on KU Coin, a very popular centralized exchange. And I think this is the first uh, centralized exchange that has listed the DeFi Pulse Index, or at least the first major one, which is awesome. I mean, I've spoken about the DeFi Pulse Index plenty of times in the in the past, and I think it's the best way to gain broad exposure to DeFi. So now that it's available on, on, a, cent on a major centralized exchange is even better because... You know, it's all well and good that it's available within DeFi and within Uniswap and all, all that sort of stuff. But a lot of people don't know how to, to use that or don't don't really want to use DeFi and just trust using a, a normal crypto kind of um, exchange or a normal centralized exchange. So the fact that we can now um, have users buying DPI on centralized exchanges, you know, maybe they, they know of DeFi, they just don't really use it, uh, but they want exposure to it. It's really, really cool. And I hope to see, you know, m more major exchanges, especially things like Coinbase would be really awesome for them to list something like this because it means institutions can start now uh, now start loading up on on dpi as well and just basically further cements dpi as the standard when it comes to DeFi indexes um, and i think it's going to remain that way that way for quite a while so yeah if you're i don't know if you don't want to spend like uh, if you don't want to play in DeFi, don't want to buy dpi there you can always buy it from ku coin now which you know is another option for for, for acquiring dpi here so uh, MC Dex or McDex uh, successfully closed a $7 million investment round, which was led by Delphi, Ventures, and Alameda Research here, with participation from a bunch of different people. You can see the list here. But I think the more exciting thing is that they've announced that they're actually deploying to Arbitrum's mainnet on May 28th, when the uh, developer mainnet goes live. This is just another project that's chosen Arbitrum uh, to, to deploy to, which is really, really cool. They are currently on Arbitrum's testnet as well, which is awesome. I think... 
a lot of people are sleep, still sleeping on Arbitrum. They're sleeping on the fact that Arbitrum has a lot of apps that they're going to be launching with on their layer two optimistic rollup that are major apps and not just like little ones. You know, I think Balance is going to be on there. Um, I think, you know, MC Dex now, and there's a few other projects that are confirmed. Chainlink's obviously going to be on there and stuff like that. I can't remember, can't remember all the projects that are going to be on there, but I think people are going to be blown away. And I'm speculating that there's going to be ones like Aave on there as well, because I don't think Aave is just going to deploy to Polygon and that's it. They're going to be on all the other different scaling solutions. So uh, yeah, really, really cool to see. I mean, congrats on the raise to, to Mcdexia, but even cooler to see that they're going to be deploying to Arbitrum's mainnet on May 28th, ready for end users when Arbitrum opens up their mainnet to everyone in sometime in June, hopefully. So Alchemex's audits are finally in here. So the as they say here, in addition to three months of being battle tested in the wild, their audit from Certic has confirmed that Alchemix is secure. So you can read the full Medium article for a breakdown of what was audited, what it covers, and and the major findings and all that sort of stuff, and any critical or, or major issues or anything like that, and and everything that was uh, that was addressed here. So I'm not going to read the audit report, of course, but just really great to see that they finally got these audits back because Alchemix is. Is, again, I've mentioned this before, it's one of my favorite DeFi projects, and it's also uh, uh, one of the most popular DeFi projects right now with lots of money inside it. So very awesome to see that they've finally got these um, these audits back. And they're also teasing that uh, ALF is coming very soon. Hopefully, like, I mean, I want it now, but like, hopefully it doesn't take too long, maybe in the next few days, a couple weeks, if that, uh, because that's going to be really, really um, cool to put my ETH into, uh, because I have ETH spread out everywhere right now. People often ask me, it's like, what do you do with your ETH? Like, how do you do yield farming? I keep it pretty simple. Like, I don't do anything too crazy. Most of my ETH right now sits in Maker. So what I do is I put my ETH into Maker, I draw die against it. And then I put that die into uh, Alchemix and I draw ALUSD against that. And then I put a ALUSD uh, back into the curve pool. Then I put the curve LP tokens into Alchemix to generate yield there. Okay, maybe it's not as simple as I as I said it was, but it's just like a few different actions to, to do that. And then uh, some of my ETH is in staking, of course, uh, but I would love to put my ETH into an AL ETH vault as well here. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and it's really, really cool to see that Alchemix is, finally, is audited as well. I love using protocol calls that um, you know, I consider it to be safe. I don't really, you know, ape into the newest protocols or whatever. I, I, I tend to take the, uh, the safety of my funds very seriously. But yeah, that's kind of like what I'm doing right now. I do have a few other yield farms out there that I do. Uh, I farm the ETH ALCX pool uh, on on Uniswap, uh, sorry, on, on SushiSwap. And I also uh, farm uh, a few other ones out there. I'm not gonna go through them all, but like people were wondering and asking kind of like in Discord the other day, I think it's like, how do I sustain myself? And they're asking me on Twitter, like if I don't have a, have a normal job or a salary and I don't make any money from the daily way, well, I just sustain myself from yield farming, right? From crypto. Uh, so yeah, that's basically a little bit of an alpha leak there, um, but that's, that's essentially what I do. And as I said, just keep keeping it simple at the end of the day. Uh, but I think that's it for today's episode. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks everyone.